turn to 1 Samuel chapter 20, uh, chapter 23 actually, chapter 21 and 22 are the beginning of his uh, fleeing, and then uh, he comes to Nob first of all, and of course uh, you should remember what happens there when uh, David lies, and Saul comes along a little bit later and finds out that they helped out David, and uh, they don't, of course he doesn't believe the priests. And so they end up slaughtering 85 priests and their families. Doeg, an Edomite, the one who carries out this uh, terrible thing. Uh, and so that's David and the priests. Then we see David and the pagan. David heads off to Gath and again lies, deceives, uh, makes them think that he's a madman. What advantage is there to uh, causing someone to think that you're a madman? <laughs> They don't take you serious, right? <laughs> Anyone? Yes? Jared? People uh, were superstitious about that. So okay. They wouldn't harm him. So they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, mess with him, wouldn't touch him because he was weird. <laughs> uh, they're superstitious about it. Did you have something to add to that? I was going to say they would leave him alone. They'd leave him alone. All right, very good. <laughs> um, and then he goes to the cave of Adullam, David and his private army. And uh, here's where we see a lot of the uh, different places. Uh, he goes to the cave of Adullam. Again, if you remember on the map that we looked at, some of those, uh, some people believe that the cave was real close by Gath. Uh, I tend to think that it was more out uh, towards the Dead Sea, um, just for the sake, uh, the simple fact that there are many, many caves out by the Dead Sea that are much bigger. Um, I, I read that there's caves out there that are big enough easily to house hundreds and hundreds of troops. Hmm. Okay, huge caves. Um, at the same time, I, and they're not over by the area of Adullam. They're not. They're not believed to be that big. However, I will give the benefit of the doubt here in the sense that um, caves cave in. No pun intended. Caves fall, caves come together, and so it's very possible that over several thousand years, the caves over towards Gath caved in and are no longer these huge uh, underground uh, chambers and so on, like there used to be maybe. <clears throat> At the same time, if I'm David, I want to get away from Gath. If I'm David, I want to go to a, a fort, a stronghold. Right? Remember we talked about that? If I'm David, I want to go and get a foreign king to help me out. So, to me it makes a lot of sense that instead of just fleeing over a little ways from Gath to Adullam, right there, he fled all the way down to the Hold, which is the next place that he comes to anyway, and then sends his parents over to Moab. I don't know, I just, I just see it much more so. This is more wilderness. He's out in the middle of nowhere down in this area. Uh, up here, he's just a few miles removed from Gath. He's a few miles, uh, he's about 20 miles from, uh, 20, 30 miles from Nob and Ramah, uh, where Sam, Saul was. So, I just see that uh, he, he would have gone much further away. That's my opinion. All right, so we see it. He goes with his private army first to Adullam, and uh, then to Moab, and then in chapter 23, where we're going to pick it up today, he uh, goes... To Kiila, Kiila. <clears throat> I feel bad uh, for how we pronounce things. Uh, when I went to Israel, I don't think there was one place that was pronounced the way I've always understood it to be pronounced. So we we butcher them and we make them sound different. If you listen to Hebrew Jews talk and they use their uh, their words and so on, it's you can tell the places, you know, they'll, they'll use a, a name that's similar, but uh, very, very different at the same time. So, I'm going to give you my version, because I don't know the other, <laughs> you know, some of these, I don't know how they say it. Keila. They told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keila, they robbed the threshing floor. So David says, Lord, shall I go there? How does David inquire of the Lord? Verse 4, then David inquired of the Lord yet again. Okay? Verse 9, David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, 
bring hither the ephod. And then the following several verses, David has a conversation with God through the ephod, finding the will of the Lord. Verse 10, Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard, O, God, o Lord God of Israel? I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Then David and his men left and went to a different place. <coughs> Is that, uh, what does that sound like? Sounds like he's finding the will of God using this ephod that was a part of the tabernacle, originally a part of the, of the uh, clothing of a high priest at the tabernacle. And I believe, it's generally believed, that the ephod came with the Urim and the Thummim, the, the instruments, I guess you would call it, used to find the will of God. Notice all of David's questions. Mm -hmm. They're all yes and no questions. I, I personally believe that the answer of the Lord wasn't the actual words, he will, del or he will come down, they will deliver thee up. David asked yes and no questions, and then he got a yes or a no answer. Okay? Uh, illustrate with a yes or no. Verse 12. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, Yes. They will deliver you up. Okay? So he's asking yes and no questions, and he gets these answers. Um... I don't understand. You know, it's hard. To, it's hard to say. Could he have found the will of God if the ephod was not there? <laughs> uh, if Abiathar hadn't come from uh, Nob with the ephod, which he did, could he have found the will of God? Um, it's hard to say. <clears throat> Any opinions on that? Joshua was his opinion. Yeah. Well, I was. It's funny you say that. I was reading that last week, and I noticed the yes and no questions. But I thought it wouldn't have been your coming because I don't know that that would have been somewhere else. Why would that have been Nob? Was Nob the? I don't know. I guess I'm wondering how do we know? Okay, where it was. I know. It's hard to say where everything was set up at. Where was the tabernacle? Was it functioning? Mm -hmm. But where there's 85 priests, sure. and it's not just a priestly city, it doesn't seem to indicate. Mm -hmm. um, it was a priestly, it was a city of priests, but it seems like it was much more than that. Like it was the center of re religious instruction at that time. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that, that actually raises a very good point. Why did Saul, from the beginning, as soon as he became king, you would think if he's a spiritual man, he should have brought the center of religion and emphasized that and made that important. What did David do? Okay, When he got to, not the first seven years, because he didn't have control of all of Israel, but as soon as he got control of all of Israel, he established the capital, and I think you can absolutely make the argument that one of the main reasons he wanted a capital was to have a center of religion, a center where the tabernacle and then eventually the temple would be established. Mm -hmm. uh, he brought the Ark of God to Jerusalem right away. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think you definitely have a problem with Saul never making that an issue. and then So, so it really, this time period is kind of... We don't know much about it. There probably was a place. Mm -hmm. It probably was functioning. I, I believe it was a knob. Okay. <clears throat> so David uh, asks the Lord for help and God delivers David. Uh, by the way, David had delivered Keilah from the Philistines attacking them. And now they turn around and sell him out to Saul, his enemy. 
<clears throat> Verse 13. Then David and his men, which were about 600, rose and departed out of Kelly and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David would escape from Kelly and forbear to go forward. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remain, remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. <clears throat> And on here today, I believe. No, it's not. But uh, you can see pictures of what now is believed to be the wilderness of Ziph. Now, there's not a lot of trees there now. Okay? There, there, there's a bare mountain that's believed to be this mountain at the wilderness of Ziph, down south of Hebron, uh, down in the wilderness. So, uh, what, what happened to all the trees? Okay? If you, want, if you ever wonder why everything's so barren over there, it didn't used to be like that. Uh, everything, it, I believe, it looks like a lot, of, a lot more things, a lot more of the area in Israel used to be covered with trees. Um, now it's very dry, uh, very dead, rocky, as can be, and so on. Um, Romans, I think primarily, I never answered my question. The Romans, it's believed that uh, they uh, literally... Uh, cut down every tree within many miles of Jerusalem. And they wanted uh, them completely demolished. They wanted the land never to be able to come back, hmm. uh, if you will. So. Yes? Uh, so that also had to do with the expansion of the Sahara <laughs> Desert? It has expanded greatly sure. over time. Sure. So that I don't know that that does, good. but it wouldn't surprise me. There's other wildernesses around there that definitely did expand. You know, the one Sinai wilderness definitely is expanding more. Okay. <clears throat> so they come to the wilderness of Ziph next. That's my third uh, place uh, I see here. Third or fourth, depending if you count Moab. But uh, Adullam, Keilam, Ziph, chapter 23, verse 13. <clears throat> so David's hiding here in the wilderness. And the word gets out to Saul that David is there. And so Saul brings his, uh, his army down. Verse 15, David saw that Saul has come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. He's in the woods. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. Now this is the only time during David's Fleeing from Saul, the only time that David and Jonathan meet. Okay? And so therefore, it's the last time they see each other on this earth. And he said unto him, but look, look at what Jonathan says to David. To me, this is great, uh, uh, shows great uh, wisdom on the part of Jonathan. <clears throat> Verse 17, he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. <clears throat> now he's wrong. But you've got to appreciate his desire. This is not saying, you're going to be the king, and I'm going to be you, uh, right next to you. I'm going to be your right hand man. You know, I'm going to be second in command. That's not what that is saying. He's saying, you're going to be the king, and I'm going to be the first guy to help you. I'm going to make you successful. I'm going to be your helper. <laughs> uh, that's humility. I love that. And that also Saul my father knoweth. And they too made a covenant before the Lord and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Imagine being David here, though. Okay, we see Jonathan making these statements. Imagine being David. He knows he's going to be the next king. <clears throat> and he doesn't march out there and say, wait a second, this isn't right. And demand his authority and demand that everybody follow him and so on. Um, he understands that he can't just expect that. It has to be earned. It has to, you know, it takes a lot of time for people to come over and so there's several years of wandering, not wandering, thinking of the children of Israel in the wilderness. There's several years of uh, fleeing, and then there's also seven more years of waiting, you know, while they had Judah, but not the rest of Israel. Uh, you see great patience and humility. So the Ziphites come to Saul to give us, saying, Doth not David hide himself? Now therefore, King, verse 20, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down. Our heart shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. 
And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye have compassion on me. Go, I pray you, prepare yet and know and see his place where his haunt is. And who has seen him there, for has told me that he dealeth very subtly. <laughs> that pathetic. I, blessed be you, Lord. You feel sorry for me. Uh, that, I appreciate that. See that one take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself. And come ye again to me with the certainty, and I will go with you, and shall come to pass that he be in the land, that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah they arose, and went to Zip before Saul, but David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. Saul also and his men went to seek him now. I, I've driven down through the wilderness down there, and it is it is just hill after hill. I mean, you, you know, we're over, I forget, I think we're at Beersheba, and we had to drive most of the way to Masada. Uh, in, it was in the evening time. And, I mean, it, was, it took a long, long, there's no straight road over there. Mm -hmm. You know, you're winding through the hills constantly. And... Um, Look at some pictures, you'll see a little bit of how dry it is when we look at Getty in a minute. But uh, it's just dry and it is windy roads and it's far. There's nothing, there's nothing straight over there. Uh, like the hills of West Virginia, hmm. if you've ever driven through there. Or the Ozarks in Missouri, closer to my home. Alright, so uh, anyway, he does not catch him. But at Ziph, Jonathan comes to David. That's the important uh, event that happens at Ziph. Then David flees, next, uh, chapter 24, to En Gedi. En Gedi. Came to pass and saw his return upon the Philistines, and told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men. Now, watch carefully where David goes at En Gedi. Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men. Upon the rocks of the wild goats. Hmm. What kind of rocks do wild goats go on? Big rocks? No, I'm not talking like that. Yes? Jagged ones. Jagged ones or Charming. steep cliffs. Okay, we'll show you that in a little bit. <clears throat> and he came to the sheep coats. By the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. This is a huge cave, big enough to hide all of David's men inside the cave. Men of David said to him, Behold oh, the day of which the Lord said unto thee. This is the day that God has given you to kill your enemy. He's right there. You can go kill him. All right? In Gedi. <clears throat> we can get those lights, please. Yeah, let's pull it up slowly. All right, here we have... <clears throat> kind of start to see things back there. Can you see in the back yet? No? Should get a little more, a little brighter as we go along. <clears throat> Let me see if I can pop this up a little You see a dome here, if that's where it's at. Gath, um, Azekah, uh, and Shoko would be right here where uh, David had killed Goliath. Um, he flees over to, uh, well here's in Gedi, here's Masada, right, by this uh, piece of land that sticks out to the Dead Sea, and Moab would be over on this side. Um, 
all along here, there's you can you can there's enough room to drive. They now have big roads along here. The the Dead Sea has gone down in in uh, depth by quite a bit. I believe mostly in the last 50, 60 years. Um, so these shallow edges now here, there's a lot more room to drive on. There's roads. But even in the ancient times, there's, there's still, you can easily, from the top of Masada, you can see the Roman road that leads from away from Masada up to En Gedi. Uh, the Romans would every day take wagons up to En Gedi, the springs there in the water supply, to get water and bring it down to their tens of thousands of troops that they had scattered in different uh, campsites around Masada. So anyway, there's lots of room to drive along here. And in Getty, uh, as you can kind of see on this picture, there's uh, the water literally uh, comes from Jerusalem, and it gathers lots of other feeders into it, and some of that drains at in Getty. It's believed that actually the Kidron Valley on the side of Jerusalem drains all the way to in Getty, over the waterfalls, and eventually down into the Dead Sea. Here's a view of En Gedi from the south. You can hardly see it, but this is this green spot here. That's the uh, <clears throat> that is the, the modern kibbutz that's there, which is a uh, a place where um, lots of uh, Jews who plan to live together. They feed each other. They feed themselves off of everything that they grow, and then they sell a lot of things. Um, Whenever we would stay at any night that we stayed in Israel, almost every night except one, we stayed at a kibbutz. Hmm. They would feed us. They have these little hostels, like a little hotel with, you know, two foot wide beds, which is fine. You know, when you go to visit Israel, at least you get uh, stay somewhere. But there's several canyons that go up into the uh, up into the hills here. But just look how rough this is. Hebron's not very far away, right over here. Hmm. Gedi, wilderness of Judah. Here's a great shot of it. There's the green section down here. There's two Nahals, as they're called, canyons. Uh, the main one, and then the Nahal David is right here. It goes up in here, and this is where that uh, the um, canyon is, where it's believed the cave was. Nahal David, Arabic. Okay, there you see two canyons. That's not the one. This is the one where the sheep coats were. And right back in here where the water falls off the plateau is a big waterfall, and then it drains from there on down. Back in the back there where that waterfall is where the cave was. And that line that is drawn there is a different path that goes from there, from the Dead Sea, all the way to Jerusalem. 13, 14, 15 miles away. There's the hall Aragut, Kibbutz in Gedi. That's not the one, there we get. All right, there we go. The Hall of David. See here? Somewhere right down in here is where it's at. And you'll see in a little bit how, how tall those walls are. They look like they're 100 feet tall. They're probably 500 feet tall hmm. or more. They're very, very large. The Hall of David. You can hike back up in here, and we did. There's some of the mountains around there. Uh, palm trees in the front. In Gedi from above, uh, there are synagogue excavations down on the side. And here's some, there's synagogue excavations, and here's underneath that uh, canopy that's there. And these are built by the, uh, uh, during the Byzantine era. Another tell that's close by. Now here's heading back up in the Hall of David, uh, the where the waterfall is in the back, and this looks small, but you'll see in a second it gets bigger and bigger. Now here's the interesting thing. You'll see in a little bit <clears throat> even more of, of what's above here. The cave almost certainly was behind this <coughs> waterfall. Um, you say, well, how? it didn't look like a cave. Uh, there are still portions of a cave that remain, and you can go back, well, we didn't, but you can go back into the cave a little bit. But it's certainly believed that all of this used to cover over the top, and there's all kinds of rocks down here in the front that fell down, 
And this, this entire cliff here is covered. You might want to guess what it's covered with? Stalactites. Okay? That used to be covered. That used to be a cave. Uh, I don't think there's any... I couldn't find any pictures here, but I have some personal pictures. Uh, up close, stalactites. I mean, you can see them plain as day, and it's just covered with them. So, and that is, you know, a solid proof that that used to be the inside of a cave. But that water is cold. Uh, we... When it was so hot that day, and we were there. Uh, we went into the water and had a great time. <clears throat> okay, here's some more of that. Now here you can see how big it is. Look at these people. <laughs> okay, waterfall back here. Look at all these rocks and stuff here. Uh, but a great place to hide way back in the back end of this thing. Of course, it's also a trap. Um, if they wanted to be. You know, Saul would have. They had a, a fire there that talked about quite a bit. Anyway, so that's the that's the most common picture. Here you can clearly see the the fall in and where where the the lid of it fell in. Okay. Just looking back out towards the Dead Sea. Sorry for all those chalk marks. You can hardly see it there, but. Um, Here's from the inside, looking back out toward the Dead Sea, and I always picture uh, Saul walking away with that view, and he hears somebody calling his name from behind, it's David. Here's the continuation back up above the waterfall, back up onto the top of the plateau. Um, here's from inside the cave. Dead Sea again. <clears throat> I have almost this exact picture out towards the Dead Sea, just really, really nice. There's a different, uh, okay, there's an old temple that's 15, 1600 years old. There's a spring there, of course, for the water supply. Uh, acacia tree. This is the other, uh, the other canyon with its own waterfall draining off the top of things. Okay. Move the lights. All right. So uh, we see uh, David hiding at Getty, and you kind of get an idea of what that was like. Uh, the beautiful blue, I, you know. When I go over there, I think of all the beautiful landscape things, and the Bible just doesn't talk much. You know, it does talk about the milk and honey, I guess, and so on. But uh, for us who live in Indiana here with the flat ground, yeah. we think of the mountains. And the Bible just never really talks about the mountains, you know, and how impressive they were and things. So, um, I guess they were used to it. But anyway, so David's... Uh, uh, confrontation with Saul here in the cave at En Gedi. Um, see if there's anything I was going to mention to you. <clears throat> Go to uh, chapter 24, verse 16. This is after David comes out of the cave and uh, meets Saul and confronts him over this. <clears throat> Came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, is this thy voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded the evil. I, you could have killed me, but you didn't. And thou hast shown this day how that thou, thou hast dealt well with me, for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, thou killest me not. For if a man find his enemy, will let him go well away. Wherefore the Lord reward thee good for that thou hast done unto me this day. And now behold, <clears throat> here we go. I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. I know well. Um, this is, he knew it. Um, this is the haunting feeling that Saul had had for years. 
um, coming out finally in truth. Swear not therefore unto me by the Lord that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore unto Saul, and Saul went home, but David and his men got them up unto the hold. All right, so did David keep his promise? Yes. Okay, in the name of Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth who had been the grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan, uh, that David brought literally into his own palace and fed him and gave him lands and everything else. So David did keep his end of the deal. All right, uh, that's the events at En Gedi. <clears throat> if we move on to chapter 25, he goes from there to Paran. Paran. The wilderness of Paran, chapter 25, verse 1 says. And here we find an unusual story of a family that lived there. The man's name was Nabal. <clears throat> what does the name Nabal mean? Fool. Curlish or churlish. Uh, he was a fool. And it wasn't just because of what he did with it concerning David. It was because of the way that he was. God basically killed him because of his foolishness. But somehow he was married to a good woman. <laughs> Always not understood that. Uh, but uh, his wife, Abigail, uh, the Bible says she was a woman of good understanding. Why'd she marry a fool then? I don't know. <clears throat> of a beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. He was a Jew. <clears throat> so, David and Nabal, see what happened here. David protected Nabal's flocks. Uh, that's why David felt that uh, Nabal should do something for him. Verse 7, the Bible says, And I have heard that thou hast shears, and now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught missing unto them all the while they were in Carmel. In other words, we protected your shepherds and servants as they worked. Now, can we have some food for 600 men? And, of course, Nabal said, and they must have been some pretty large flocks, you know, when, like, they were taking care of two sheep, and they say, you know, in return, can we have food for 600 men for two weeks, or anything like that, but, <clears throat> so, David sends word that they need food, and Nabal answered David's servants in verse 10 and said, who is David, and who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master, Oh, what's he saying? Who is David? Yeah, he's the one, the servant that broke away from his master. All David is, is a servant of Saul's who left his master. I'm not helping him. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and given unto men, whom I know not whence they be? They're just the common men. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not important like uh, Saul and his men. So David's young men turned away and went again and came and told David. And David said, get your swords on, boys, we're going after him. But one of the young men, in verse 14, told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. That's the slang term that we use now, but that's a biblical term there. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us, both by night and day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. So you see there again, that they had helped the men, the servants of Nabal. So what does Abigail do? She quickly uh, makes haste and takes 200 loaves, two bottles of wine, five sheep, ready dressed, five measures of parched corn, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs and laid them. Then she got the whole uh, mess together, a food, mess of food together, and quickly brought it out to uh, David and his men. And uh, David leaves off his plans to kill Nabal. Um, God instead kills Nabal. Uh, the Bible says that Nabal became uh, stoned. Go ahead and make your jokes about that one. <laughs> Uh, it's the first time in the Bible, right, where someone's doing drugs here. He was stoned. 
Sorry? I wasn't even thinking that Jesus said that. Oh, yes. <laughs> Verse 37, and he became as a stone. <laughs> his wife, and his heart died within him. It came to pass about ten days after the Lord smote Nabal that he died. All right, so David and Nabal. David and Abigail. What happens with David and Abigail? Uh, her wise kindness spared her home. Uh, but then she also ends up becoming the wife of David. The wife of David. <clears throat> Verse 42, Abigail hastened and rose and rode one ass with five damsels of hers that went after her, and she went after the messenger of David and became his wife. And then the author here takes the time to tell us about David's other wives. Verse 43, David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were also both of them his wives. But Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Falti, the son of Laish, which was of Jalom. Jalom. So, what had happened? This is his second and third wives. Um, bad sign here, right? What does this mean? This means more than he wanted to have more than one wife. What, what is, it, what is the, the meaning of this, that he takes on more and more wives? Okay, what's happening here? What's the common thinking in these days about a man who was rich and well off? Yes? I guess in a broad sense, he's uh, allowing worldly uh, stronghold to come into it. Okay, and that's true too. Okay, I'm, I'm not talking about that primarily, though. I'm obviously, he's dead wrong. <laughs> Justin? Uh, kind of show of power and have influence. Sure. Okay. <coughs> yes. And Jared? Well, and also by Mary and Abigail, he probably got all of Mabel's land and goods. Sure. Yeah. So he's, he's gaining power. You, you, you get more and more wives illustrating your power and strength that you have the ability to take care of all of these things. Um, it's very common in these times, in, at this time and of course much of Bible history, it was very common to have, a, if you're a king, to have a harem of wives. Many wives to solidify your uh, treaties and to solidify your... Uh, relations with other countries, or in this case, I think it's very true, he was gaining all the land that belonged to Nabal. Um, he's getting power, he's consolidating his power, and he shows that by marrying more and more wives. <clears throat> we know that he had several more wives later on. Uh, one that we know for sure, uh, that he, he had uh, Absalom from Gesher, uh, which... Absalom's mother was from Gesher, which had been to the southwest, down by the Philistine land, south of the Philistines, actually. So, there's another wife that he had. Uh, this is not one of the mothers of Ab or, or of Absalom here. So, um, I don't remember where Amnon and Tamar came from, but anyway, so, uh, he's got quite a few wives. Oh, oh, the obvious one, right? Bathsheba! Okay, so five, six wives, uh, he's, I forget exactly how many at this point. But. All right, so at Paran, David and Abigail, David and Nabal. <clears throat> We're going to see uh, his wife, or his first wife, Michelle. We're going to see her show up later on after David is consolidating the kingdom, after he gets all of Israel and Judah uh, under his reign. Uh, he comes back and uh, does some... Pretty uh, weird things um, in relation to uh, his first wife and her children. So keep that in mind. Falti, the son of Laish, you'll see him again. All right, David next in chapter 26 comes to Ziph again. And the Ziphites came to Saul and to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself? Hey, he's here. And Saul rose and falls for it again. He says, wait a second, that's not right that he's out there getting the people to like him. Uh, and he's jealous again, so he goes after him, even after what had happened at En Gedi. 
David sent out spies and understood that Saul was coming very deep. And David arose in verse 5 and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay in after the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench. And the people pitched round about him. They pitched their tents. And they're all sleeping there at Ziph. Now I imagine he's watching from above somewhere. He's watching from a wooded hill where they can't see him, but he's watching them. And he sees what's going on here, and he says to those around him, Hey, anybody want to go with me down to the camp? They're all sleeping down there. And uh, verse 6, Then answered David and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, to Abishai the son of Zariah, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. All right, so let's talk about uh, some of David's family members at this point. I haven't done this yet. Um, David had a sister. Okay? Uh, Zeruiah, how do you spell this? <clears throat> Zeruah. Zeruiah is, I think, the, the way that we would pronounce it. David had a sister named Zeruiah. She had three sons, at least, that we know of. Sons of Zariah. Okay, who are those three sons? Abishai. And she also had Asahel. He was killed later on by the uh, servants of Saul's. You know, after Saul died, they had uh, you know, several confrontations, the family of Saul with the, the men of, of David. Asahel was killed there. And then the third one was Joab. Joab. Okay? Now... These three, at least two of them, these two, Abishai and Joab, are one of David's mighty men, and Joab was the captain of David's host. He's the captain of David's army. Okay, just so you're aware, on the other side, you've got Saul, and uh, the captain of his host is Abner. Abner, and uh, he's a crude, mean person. Anybody who would work for Saul has to be this way, right? Uh, continually. Anyway, so, but Abishai and Joab, Abishai uh, is, is a man's man. Abishai is always involved. Uh, when it was time to, uh, when they were at the cave at Gedi, Abishai is the one who said, look, here's your chance, kill him. Uh, when they come here to Ziph, the second time at Ziph, uh, Abishai says, I'll go with you. And they literally go down into the camp with all of these people sleeping around them. They didn't know that the Lord, I don't think they knew the Lord had caused the deep sleep to come on all these people. And they're walking quietly in the middle of all these sleeping. What if one person wakes up? I mean, they're dead. And they walk right through the middle of this. Um, and then another time when David said, oh, Man, I would like to have some water from the well at Bethlehem. And uh, Abishai is the one who, uh, who uh, goes to get that water. He's a part of it. Now, very weird, but Esahel is killed uh, soon after that. I don't remember exactly when he <coughs> dies. You remember how Joab dies? <laughs> Solomon has his cousin put to death for trying to take the kingdom over. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. I just think it's so weird. You can't imagine, you know, <laughs> being a king and putting my cousin to death, you know. Of course, his half-brother was put to death also. Mm -hmm. That's even closer. Okay. <clears throat> so they go down to the camp and uh, David and uh, Abishai there, they take the uh, spear, 
They take the water, a cruise of water, which had been a water jug from Saul's bolster, and they get them away, and no man saw it nor knew it either way. They went over the other side, stood on the top of a hill afar off. That's probably where he was at the beginning. And he yells across to Abner, Abner, answerest thou not? Aren't you awake, Abner? You're sleeping. Abner finally kind of wakes up and rubs his eyes a little bit, says, Who art thou that criest to the king? David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man, and who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. <laughs> uh, David has a nice sense of humor here. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. Now see where the king's spear is in the cruise of water that was at his bolster. And Saul wakes up, and he's hearing this, and he knew David's voice, and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, What more doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in mine hand? So they back off. Verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul is precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool, and have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold, the king's spirit, let my the only come and fetch it. I have sinned. This is not repentance here. Um, yep, you caught me. I, I did it again. I'm sorry. I'm going home. He, he never changes anything. He just changes his mind temporarily. Mm -hmm. And he goes right back to it. <clears throat> Verse 25, Saul here admits again that David's going to be a great man. Blessed be thou, my son David, thou shalt both do great things and also shalt still prevail. I know you're going to win, David. You're going to win. You're going to prevail. Okay, Ziph. Next, David knows it's not over. David next flees to Ziklag of the, I'm sorry, he flees to the Philistines. And he's given the city of Ziklag to keep his people in. Verse such, 1 of chapter 27, David said in his heart, I shall not perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of the hand. So he goes to the Philistines and he dwelt with Achish at Gath. David with his two wives, Ahimam and Abigail, he was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. Now, this is the last time that Saul seeks after David. Because uh, the next thing that happens is the Philistines head out on this, uh, this big campaign, I believe, to take back what they had lost to Saul much earlier, and to Jonathan primarily. Uh, Michmash. So, the, the Philistines attack the land of Israel by going all the way up the coast and down into the valley of Jezreel in Armageddon. Saul has to leave off fighting David and go fight the real enemy, the Philistines. David, as odd as it seems, is on the side of the Philistines, supposedly helping them and protecting them. Of course, we know that he wasn't, but that's what they thought. So David's on their side and claiming to fight against Saul just to keep his neck, you know, keep himself alive in the Philistine territory. Question or comment? Um, I was going to see in that verse 1 where he says, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. Would that be like a statement showing that he didn't have faith in God at that point? Probably so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he basically God anointed him earlier. Now yeah, it's like, you well, know he's the king. Yeah. I guess I'm going to die anyway, so here we go. Yeah. After several years of running, you, you can't blame him too much for thinking, man, someday he's going to surprise me. You know, someday he's going to catch me. Um, kind of gives you the same, I don't know if you heard a few days ago, <clears throat> ISIS said that they're going to, that they actually have the address of where the Navy SEAL lives, or did live, who killed Osama bin Laden, mm. and they put out a threat personally against him mm. that they're going to come and catch him. So, needless to say, he and his family are all split up now. His wife is in hiding. Uh, he 
came out yesterday and said, I know how to defend myself. That's what he said. <laughs> Which I don't think he should have said that because that just puts a bigger target right on you, you know. Everybody's going to try to kill him now. But uh, anyway, how would you, you like to be there? The, the one person named out, they know where you are, or they think they do, and they're trying to kill you. And David finally says, enough's enough. I want to have some peace. It evidently looks like some of this time while he's in the wilderness, or he didn't have his family even with him. But we see here that he did. He wanted his family back. He wanted some peace. And, and ultimately God used it to where, where David didn't have to fight against the children of Israel, but he also didn't have to, he didn't have to fight against Saul, who was his king. He's able to go to, I'm not saying it was everything right and I didn't trust the Lord, but ultimately God used this to get him out of the way. And then Saul and Jonathan, God put his judgment upon Saul's family and killed them with the Philistines, and then the Philistines were defeated, uh, eventually, uh, by David. So, um, uh, let's see here. So the next place I have, I'm, I'm calling this Ziklag, you can call it the Philistines, but they give David the city of Ziklag. Uh, what does he do while he's at Ziklag? <clears throat> by the way, Ziklag down in the south, south of the land of the Philistines. So he's, he's way out of the way, I guess is the point. Um, there's no chance here of Saul coming down to Ziklag with his army. Okay? Besides the fact the Philistines are keeping Saul occupied. But here at Ziklag, he acts as a mercenary for Achish. He's acting as a mercenary. We are going around helping the Philistines fight their battles. And in reality, he wasn't. Uh, he said, oh, man, we're, going, we're invading Judah. Man, those, those cities that, you, that they tell my enemy Saul where I am all the time. And I'm tired of this. And so we're attacking cities of Judah. When in reality, they were attacking roving bands of, of Bedouin-type uh, nomadic type people, the Amalekites especially. And uh, so they're heading south into the desert, pretending that they're going over to Judah, lying about it. <laughs> uh, do I approve of it? No. Uh, I don't think it's right at all what they're saying, but anyway, that's what's going on. Um, he attacked Israel's enemies while he was there at Philist or in the land of the Philistines, pretending to attack Israel. Um, in reality, he was doing the opposite even. He wasn't just not attacking Judah. He would take what he had captured from the Amalekites and send it to the cities of Judah. Hmm. What's he doing? Right? Getting some friends. <laughs> uh, these are my people, the tribe of Judah. I'm going to help you. And uh, so he or captures spoil from one group gives it to the other, and he's playing the Philistines the whole time. Hmm. Um, this is a delicate situation. <laughs> Very delicate. Um, Alright, so while he's doing that, off uh, on a raiding <coughs> party one time, here come the Amalekites, and they raid Ziklag. And I'm sure they were, they were paying back what they felt they should do to Ziklag. They had been attacked themselves, and now they're returning the favor and uh, trying to get revenge. We find that, um, uh, let's see here. Actually, it wouldn't be till the next chapter. For, uh, chapter 30. They come uh, uh, back to Ziklag. On the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken all the women and everyone with them. All right, so Ziklag is destroyed. Uh, David, of course, uh, is almost stoned to death by his men. They think all of their women folk are dead. And uh, they chase after the Amalekites and get their families back. And I think that's all I'm going to deal with there. <clears throat> now, of course, David has nowhere to live. Okay, so now, uh, with the timing of it, uh, the, the Philistines would destroy Saul, 
and destroy that connection. So now David uh, will, will be able to go back into the land of Judah and have some peace. <clears throat> okay, that brings us then lastly, and I have this parallel to uh, uh, the flight from Saul, David fleeing from Saul. We're going to call this the death of Saul, or the end of Saul. <clears throat> so, this is all under David, but it technically is uh, still dealing with Saul. Of course, David isn't the king yet. All right, the death of Saul. Let's quickly finish this section up. <clears throat> um, in chapter 28 and chapter 29 is where we find uh, the story of what's going on here with the death of Saul. Um, Saul is about to meet the Philistines in battle. And David is not with the Philistines. David, of course, is down there uh, at Ziglag, dealing with the Amalekites during this whole time. But uh, the Philistines originally had said, David, we want you with us. You know, you're, the, you're the, the warrior, you've got 600 troops, we need your help. And David, of course, says, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Finally, the Lord intervenes, where the, the leaders of the army, the Philistines, go to their king and say, look, this isn't right. They used to sing about this guy, how many of us he killed. So it'd be good if he didn't fight on our side, he might turn on us. Hmm. And so David, uh, David, that's when he goes back to Ziklag and deals with that whole thing. Uh, Saul... On the other hand, Saul is up north dealing with the, the main army of the Philistines, and he knows that he's in bad trouble. Look at chapter 28, verse 4. The Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. That's a mountain. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines... He was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not. That's the main reason I think he's afraid. Uh, that he gets no answer from the Lord anymore. The Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. So, of course, Saul goes... To meet with the witch. I'm going to call this three meetings here underneath, underneath this point, the death of Saul. Three meetings. First is the meeting with the witch. Saul disguises himself um, and goes down there. You talk about a Halloween costume. <laughs> oh, man. So Saul's disguised and he meets with this witch. Well, little does he know, but he's about to meet more than a witch. Uh, he's going to secondly meet Samuel. Remember his old buddy Samuel? <laughs> the one he got along with so great. The one who's now dead. And here he comes again, haunting me even in his death. Uh, but here comes Samuel, and Samuel says to Saul, Saul, tomorrow you're going to be with me. You're done for. You're dead. Yes. So was it really Samuel, or was it... Oh, yes. I guess it was. <clears throat> well, what do you believe, Mr. Shark? I know we okay, had so, this question before. But it comes to Jared again. So yeah. these hard questions. All right, so uh, the Bible says, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Verse uh, number 12. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. She knew it was Saul. She put two and two together because she saw Samuel. Hmm. So she knew that Saul had, had, uh, had outlawed, if you will, made it illegal for any witches to be kept alive. So he had gone around killing witches. Why would Saul do that? Samuel. Samuel. So when she saw Samuel, see, she was already afraid before this, you know, that if Saul finds out that I'm here, he's going to kill me. So when she saw Samuel come up, she was afraid of Saul. She knew it was Saul then. The king said to her, be not afraid. What did you see? And he said to her, what form is he of? She said, an old man. He's covered with a man. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. Samuel said to Saul, why has that his quiet? <clears throat> then said Samuel. <laughs> I believe it's Samuel. 
I don't see any other way around it. Is it his spirit? Yes. Is it his spirit? Yes. Um, but I believe God, and this spirit is not a lying spirit. Mm -hmm. It's a truthful spirit. In fact, this spirit of Samuel rebuked Saul and said, you're going to be dead tomorrow. And it happened exactly the way he said it. So a lying spirit, if he lied, I'd have, and then obviously I would very much question it. But everything was truthful about it. Can God send a spirit back from the dead? Of course. Mm -hmm. Happened other times. Yes? I find it hilarious in verse 10 how she says, Don't tell Saul. And he says, Saul swore in her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall be no punishment happen. <laughs> <laughs> as much as there's a God in heaven. Right? Talk to the devil. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I talk to the devil. It's unbelievable. <laughs> okay, so uh, he goes, meets with Samuel, and then third, he meets with the Philistines, and he's killed. On Mount Gilboa. <clears throat> Alright, we'll stop there today. Uh, we'll pick up with uh, some things about David in the next class period. 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 David in the next class period.